Catherine Cavagnaro, uh, 2018 Fast Team Rep of the Year, 2020 CFI of the Year. She owns Ace, Aer uh, Ace Aerobatic in Suwannee, Tennessee. And if that name sounds familiar, her legacy is she took that over from William Kirshner, which is a heck of a thing. So, with no further ado, Catherine, you're on. Thank you very much for, am I? Okay. Thank you very much for joining me during lunch today. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so uh, my full-time job is as a mathematics professor at Suwannee, the University of the South. Uh, I also, uh, as Bob mentioned, run uh, Ace Aerobatic School in Suwannee, Tennessee. So I took over for um, Bill Kirshner. I uh, taught with him for the last few years of his life uh, and then have kept the school uh, going ever since. And about Bill Kirshner, uh, by the way, how many of you are flight instructors? Okay, so uh, yeah, I have to say, uh, put in a plug for his book. His book uh, is, is still in print and remains, I think, one of the best um, resources for flight instructors I've seen. It's called the Flight Instructor's Manual. Um, and he, ha he was a big influence uh, on my life, and he is the one who helped me combine my interests in mathematics and aviation. I helped him with some of the math uh, for, him, for his uh, books, uh, and he was the one who took me over to the University of Tennessee Space Institute. Uh, and there I did some flight testing um, and did some math research for them, so I really owe that uh, my my profession uh, and my uh, expertise as a flight instructor really to Bill. Uh, and that's what a mentor uh, can do. So all of you flight instructors are mentors for your students. So don't ever underestimate the, you know, the effect that you can have on the trajectory of, of somebody's career. So good on you for being flight instructors. Um, and I'm hoping that I can share with you today a couple of the ways that I combine sort of math and aviation. Uh, I also write the Flying Smart column for AOPA Pilot Magazine, and they let me combine, again, my interests in mathematics and aviation. Oh yeah, I'm a designated examiner for the FAA as well. So one of the things I'm gonna share with you today are some of the things that I see on practical exams uh, that, that could be better. So um, I'm going to talk about two um, issues that, again, with which I see issues on practical exams, takeoff performance and weight and balance. And so the better informed that you all can be as flight instructors, the better information you're going to be conveying uh, to your students. So each of these refers to uh, one of my articles uh, for Pilot Magazine. And uh, this is one uh, from What Matters Most, which came out about uh, a year ago. So the setup is, and again, the, the deficiency that I often see on practical exams is a lack of facility with performance charts. Uh, so here is uh, some, a takeoff performance scenario that will set the stage for letting me see whether someone can, can use their performance charts well. Whoops, wrong way. Okay, so here's a scenario that I will often uh, set up, and it's one in which we're taking off from a high altitude airport. So right off the bat, we're, we're already bumping up against the performance capabilities of a lot of general aviation aircraft. And you'll see this scenario involves uh, Laramie Regional, which is up at elevation 7284. And I find that in, you know, maybe if, if you're from this area, maybe those practical exams, um, you know, naturally include these kinds of scenarios. But a lot of mine, I, you know, I live in southeast Tennessee and it's, it's pretty flat and it's much lower than it is uh, out, out in this area. So, uh, if my candidates haven't had a chance to sort of chew on some of these procedures involving high altitude uh, operations, then in preparation for the practical exam, I'm going to give them uh, that opportunity. So again, Laramie is a pretty high uh, airport. And so I might have somebody, I might ask them, okay, well, why don't you 
share with me what kind of distance you might need for uh, takeoff. And here is basically a redone performance uh, chart from my own uh, Bonanza. This is an E33C. And, uh, you know, of course, takeoff performance charts can differ. Sometimes they're, they're a graph like these. Sometimes it's a table. Um, but I really like this graph because it, it shows you the components that go into uh, takeoff performance. There are four panels. The leftmost is it purely calculates density altitude. That's all it does. It takes uh, air temperature and pressure altitude, and it comes up with density altitude. Do I get a pointer? I don't know. Okay, so right here, I actually just superimposed these. This was not part of the original um, diagram in my POH, but if you put in a temperature and a pressure altitude and move over to the right, it tells you your density altitude. So in terms of atmospheric conditions, density altitude is um, is what's important, okay? Which again is a combination of actual altitude, pressure, and temperature. The next panel shows you uh, the effect that weight can have on takeoff performance. Uh, then we have winds, and then you know the presence or absence of uh, an obstacle. So. Putting all these things together, you get some um, estimate of takeoff performance. So for example, let's start with the less leftmost panel. So one thing I like to do is sort of play with, make variations in each one of these panels to see what the effects are. Because if you do some of this playing around, you'll sort of see what matters most. and that's ended up being the name of my article, is uh, you can see the um, various effects of, uh, you know, factors. So for example, if we are taking off on a standard day from sea level, then I'm at sea level, of course, standard temperature is uh, 15 degrees centigrade. So I go up, and if I come straight across, then that refers to being at max gross zero wind takeoff roll, right? So uh, no, no obstacle. And it looks like I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of about 850 feet for the ground roll. Whereas if I'm up, say, at Laramie on a standard day, which the standard day refers to following that, that green line, that's the ISA uh, line, if I'm up at Laramie, max gross, no wind, no obstacle, I have over a 1,500 foot um, ground roll. So that's roughly a 100% penalty for being at that altitude, okay? So al sheer altitude makes a big difference. Okay. All right, so we have to calculate pressure altitude to get into that left panel. And I, I see a lot of times that folks don't know how to calculate pressure altitude. So to calculate pressure altitude, you take your field elevation, and then you're going to add to that a 1,000 times the difference between your um, 29.92 and your actual altimeter setting. So notice that when the altimeter setting is higher than standard, then our pressure altitude is gonna be field elevation plus a negative number. So high altimeter setting, that's a good thing. Sometimes I see that candidates have that backward. So for example, for our scenario, if, I, uh, if our altimeter setting is 30.32, we actually get a pressure altitude 400 feet lower than field elevation. And think about the days that you fly. 30.32 is probably one of the higher ones. I think that, you know, the, probably the highest altimeter I've ever seen when I've flown is like 30.7 something, somewhere in that range. And that is very, very rare. So the grand scheme of, in the grand scheme of things, Altimeter setting doesn't make a huge difference, right? So it's not one of the things that necessarily 
matters most. In this case, with an altimeter setting of 30.32, we get a little bit of help. It's as if the airplane is about 400 feet lower uh, than, than it truly is uh, on the ground at Laramie. So again, high altimeter settings help, but arguably not a whole lot. Okay, so, um, for instance, if we compare those two, again, we're leaving everything else the same, max gross, no wind, ground roll, you can see that we're getting just a little, a tiny bit of help, probably less than 100 feet in terms of uh, takeoff distance. So again, it makes a difference, but not a whole lot. Okay? Um, so now let's uh, take into account temperature. So my general setup is I'm going to compare Laramie on a standard day versus Laramie on a, a hotter day. So instead of being closer to 30 or excuse me, zero degrees centigrade, we're going to be more like 30 degrees centigrade. And you can see the difference in uh, ground roll is, is much more uh, affected, you know, so ground roll is much more affected by temperature in general really than it is in with respect to pressure. But by having your students play with these sorts of things, you can really impress upon them the profound difference that temperature makes. So instead of taking off at say two in the afternoon, maybe waiting till seven in the morning would, would be a better idea. Now let's take into account weight. And again, as a mathematician, I should have started by saying, one of the reasons I love this chart is it shows lines and the slopes matter. So the, the steeper the, the line, the more that factor affects takeoff performance. So you can see by these downward sloping lines uh, that weight can have a pretty decent effect on uh, takeoff performance. So instead of flying my Bonanza and Max Gross um, for this scenario where it's a standard day at Laramie, suppose that uh, I'm going to fly her at about 2,900 pounds, which is about 400 pounds down from Max Gross. You can see that that actually has a pretty big effect, reducing my takeoff roll by almost a third. Okay, so weight can have uh, a, a big difference. I, I often tell folks uh, an example that I had where years ago I was, I was going on a, um, on a vacation with my two kids, and my home airport uh, does not have the longest runway. It's only 2,000 MSL, but I'll tell you, there are days when it's pretty warm, and this was a summer vacation, uh, when it's pretty warm where I just didn't really feel like I'd be mother of the year by, you know, throwing the, the kids and the bags in there uh, and then taking off. Um, you know, my performance chart said I could make it and, and with definitely room to spare, but you never actually have to take off. So what I ended up doing is I drove my kids down to the nearby airport that's a thousand feet lower, much longer runway, drove back up to Suwanee, took off, picked them up, and with just an hour extra, uh, I was on my way. So I just want to share that also that, you know, we should be sharing with our students that there's always a plan B, you know, or there always should be a, a plan B. So uh, weight can have a, a big effect on takeoff performance. Okay, so now let's suppose that we are at Laramie, standard day, flying 2,900 pounds. Let's look at winds and the effect that winds can have. So in a no wind situation, you can see that my takeoff dif distance is somewhere around 1,100-ish feet. Um, so let's suppose that I have 15 knots on the nose. If in that case, then I'm gonna get at least a couple hundred feet less uh, on my takeoff roll. That's a good thing, right? Uh, so that, that actually has a, a nice effect for minimizing uh, takeoff distance. I'll tell you one problem that I see a lot on practical exams is say my runway is 1836 and uh, you know the winds are 
260 at 10. I see, I, I, I see the candidate remember the 10, but not the fact that it's almost a total crosswind, and you're gonna get almost no help from that. So I'll see them sort of blindly use 10, and we need to take into consideration that you're not gonna get the full effect of, of that um, wind to, to help you. So please share that with your students. What I kind of like to do, honestly, is just do a no wind. Just don't even include the winds, figuring that when I take off into the wind, any wind is only gonna help me. Um, but, okay, so assuming you've done this correctly and you truly have a 15 knot on the nose help, uh, again, we, we get a nice uh, help here. Now what's interesting is this, this panel also will take into account a bit of a tailwind. And look how much steeper the tailwind lines are going up compared with the headwind lines going down. That's telling a story. What that's saying is that a headwind helps you less than a tailwind hurts you. So taking off with a tailwind can be a really bad idea. Now there might be a good reason for it. Uh, for example, my home airport, uh, ideally runways are flat. This one kind of undulates. And if you take off on our runway six, you get this uphill right where you didn't need it. Uh, so I'll often take off with a slight tailwind on 2-4 because you get a little bit of a downhill where you need it. So again, there can be reasons to take off with a tailwind, but have a good reason before uh, you do. Okay, and um, the last panel here refers to obstacle height. Uh, so if, and under the scenario I presented, standard day Laramie, 2,900 pounds, no winds, you'll see that I have a ground roll of about 1,100 feet and my distance to clear a 50 foot obstacle should be around 1,800 feet. Um, so I wanna point out though that not, obs not all obstacles are 50 feet high. <laughs> so you know, my, my home airport has trees that are closer to 80 feet high. So that's something that's good to, uh, to take into consideration. Uh, but I, I find a lot of candidates don't know how to interpret this. So zero height refers to your ground roll that's your distance to clear a zero foot obstacle. And then of course, this is your distance to clear a 50 foot obstacle. I have to call uh, a little bit of BS here on, on this last panel uh, because, um, you know, for example, the story it's telling, suppose that I were at a much lower weight and I come over here with a tailwind with, I guess I have about a 10 knot tailwind, I'd be arriving at the very same place as I was with my other scenario. But here's the thing, that tailwind as I take off is gonna continue to affect me as I'm in the air. So I have to say, I have to take this panel especially with uh, sort of a big grain of salt. It's basically saying I'd be at the same position even though I have got 15 or I guess 10 or 15 knots pushing me after I take off. So what I like to do is um, impress upon my students and candidates after the practical exam that uh, what they should be doing is calculating this, they should know how to use this chart, but then they should apply a very healthy safety margin. One of my favorite articles uh, from AOPA which I didn't write, but I actually wish I had written, because uh, it's kind of down my alley. Dave Hirschman and Richard McSpadden wrote an article a few years ago on um, these takeoff performance charts. And they very carefully did these calculations for, I think it was a 182 and a Bonanza. And then they went out and actually calculated, they had people with measuring tapes and, and such, and they actually calculated uh, the distance that they really needed to take off. And there was only one situation in which they didn't need 30% more than what the book said they would need, 30%. So at the time they came out and said, well, at least add 50%. And then they came out later and said, 
oh, double it. So I actually use that. You know, if I, for example, uh, if it says I'm going to need 1,800 feet for that takeoff, I'm probably not going to take off unless I've got about 3,000 or 3,500 feet of runway distance. So, um, so also applying, helping your students apply personal minimums is an important part of all of our jobs as flight instructors. And as a designated examiner, I often see folks who um, haven't assembled a collection of personal minimums that make sense. So please, instructors, uh, help your students um, assemble uh, a set. All right, so again, uh, more information is uh, in my article from about a year ago. And most of my articles touch on these sorts of, of subjects. So again, I always love to, to hear from uh, readers. So feel free to uh, contact me. So in order for this to balance, this is like the seesaw, right? If you have a, two kids on a seesaw, you got a big kid and a little kid, in order for it to balance, the big kid has to be closer to the fulcrum, right? So that's one of the reasons why our airplanes have long tail feathers, right? The farther away you can put that tail down force, the less of a tail down force you need to have because your weight times the distance between the weight and the lift vector has to be equal to the tail down force times that distance there. So the bigger you can make B, the smaller you can make your tail down force. So, so yeah, and this is the, the point I'm making here. If you decrease the weight, uh, then you can get away with a, a smaller tail down force. Also, if you decrease the, um, the distance between your weight and your lift vector, you can also get away with a smaller tail down force. So what that says is if you load your aircraft with a rearward CG, you have a more efficient airplane. You don't have to have as much tail down force, therefore you don't have to generate as much lift. Um, so real, Tommy flew with he, me here yesterday. I, I should have put you in the baggage compartment in the back. We would have a really efficient uh, airplane. So uh, here's your most efficient airplane ever. It's where your CG is directly opposite your uh, lift vector. Of course, it has a downside, right? And we don't want to do that. Generally, the rear um, limit of your envelope still gives you some distance between your lift and your, um, your weight vector. OK, so here is the. Um, information for my airplane with the CG positions for the fuel, the pilots, the rear seats, the baggage area and such. And the datum line, it, it doesn't matter. It's, for some airplanes, it's the firewall. Some airplanes, it's the tip of the spinner. This one happens to be somewhere in the middle of the spinner. It could be the moon. It doesn't matter, okay? As long as all of the measurements are based off the distance between the center of that point and the reference or the datum line, uh, all of the calculations will be the same. So for example, my airplane has an empty CG position of 80.7. But once you put fuel, some people in the plane, and some bags, uh, the loaded CG position will move back to um, about 85 uh, inches aft of datum. And what's amazing to me, if you think about this, maybe I'm the only one who's uh, amused by this. It does not take much to amuse me. Uh, but if you look at the forward and aft CG positions for my airplane, it's between 77 and 87 inches aft of datum. That's it. That's the leeway that I have to safely load my airplane. So I, I, I don't know. I'm amazed by that. All right. So uh, here is her uh, envelope. And again, you can see that the fore and aft limits. You'll also see that this edge is missing uh, at the upper left part. So what happens is if I load my airplane with a more aft CG, then I have a more efficient airplane. 
And um, I'm, I'm gen because I'm flying at a lower angle of attack, I don't need to generate as much lift uh, to, to balance that airplane. So we get a more efficient airplane. So if you want to um, fly more f with more efficiency, you should put a, w load your plane with a more aft CG. If you are, have a more forward CG, um, you have a less efficient airplane. Uh, what's interesting, though, is the reason that top corner is missing is, um, well, it refers to flying with a very forward CG, so I'm dialing in nose up trim to, to account for that, uh, and I'm, I have a heavier weight. I'm dialing even more nose up trim to account for that. So you're flying at a very high angle of attack in that upper corner, and you're, you're critical situation there is going to be coming in for a landing, okay? Because that's when we really want to get our nose up for a nose high flare and landing. And you might run out of elevator authority to make that landing, to get that nose up in the flare. So that's why that corner is often missing from most weight and balance um, envelopes. Uh, there's the good part about having a forward CG is you tend to have a more stable airplane, and with a rearward CG, you tend to have um, a less stable airplane. I just want to focus on this conventional airplane and look at the effects of CG position. And this is a bit simplified. I've just made the numbers simple. And it's not so much the actual numbers. I just want you to see the relative effect. So um, we have an airplane, area is 100 square feet, tail area is 20 square feet. It doesn't matter. You know, the, the big effects I'll, I'll want you to see in just a sec. So I'm going to assume that the weight is two feet in front of the center of lift, and then we've got 12 feet between the weight and the tail. So in, in, in other words, I'm 10 feet between the lift and the tail. Like I said before, it doesn't matter where the, your reference line is in any of these calculations. It just matters that you are consistent. So um, at this point, I'm going to make my argument based on where the weight vector is. I'm going to me measure from there. So I'm going to assume that the angle of attack of the wing is 4 degrees. Uh, so, the moment, in other words, that twisting moment, uh, because the lift wants to, wants to pull the airplane over, over the weight vector, right? It wants to nose the airplane over. The moment is actually not equal to 800, but it's proportional, okay? So, um, the moment is the lift times the distance. So the moment is actually proportional to 800. So I have a twisting moment of 800 foot-pounds in the you know, counterclockwise direction. My tail force is, needs to be negative 800. It needs to be 800 in the opposite direction for the airplane to balance. So in other words, my, the angle of attack of the tail has to be negative three and some change. In other words, it has to be negative because it's going to go in the other direction. The only point here is that those two moments have to be the same. Okay, so what I want to get to right here is the notion of angle of attack stability. So I referenced stability earlier. So why is it that when we load our airplane with a more forward CG, we have a more stable airplane? Here's why. So suppose here is our setup and we get this gust of wind that's going to raise the angle of attack of both the wing and the tail. And again, I'm not so interested in focusing on the specific numbers. I just want you to see the relative effect. What happens when we get a gust that brings our nose up? So what we'll do is we'll assume that suddenly now the angle of attack of the wing is 5 degrees instead of 4 and negative 2.33 instead of negative 3.33. So what's the net effect of that? I'm just going to slip over here. You'll see that we get a moment provided by the lift of 1,000, moment provided by the tail of negative 560, and the difference in those is going to push our nose back down. 
that's, that's angle of attack stability. If we get our angle of attack raised, the tendency of the airplane is going to be to push it back down. So really the only number I want you to remember here is that 440. Okay, so if we get a gust that lifts our nose or our wings um, by a degree, we get a moment of 440 pushing us back down. Okay? All right, so um, same situation, but now what we're going to do is suppose we have a gust that lowers our nose by a degree. So we're flying at three degrees and negative 4.33 on the tail. Okay, so our nose has just gone down. What's the effect of that? We get a larger moment from the tail compared with the wing, and we get a negative 440 moment um, pulling the nose back up. Okay, so again, it's the 440 I want you to remember. I don't care if you remember anything else. Okay, so. Now what we're going to do is let's go ahead and fly with a little more rearward CG. So we're going to pull the weight back to one foot instead, and everything else is the same. You can see that we don't have as big a moment because we've moved our arm back. And the idea is that suppose that we now have a gust that picks up our nose. We get a moment of 500 going forward. We get a moment of negative 180 backward. And again, it's the, it's the counterclockwise moment that wins. But look at the difference. 440 versus 320. So my point is that when you are flying with a more rearward CG, you should have a, as long as you're in the envelope, you should have a stable airplane, but maybe it comes back to its trim condition with just a little less enthusiasm than it did before. So that's what happens as you progress backward in the envelope, is your plane should be stable, but it's not doing that with quite the enthusiasm that it did before. And again, this just goes to show you that it also works if you get a gust that pushes you down. It's just not as enthusiastic about getting you back uh, to your trimmed angle of attack. And again, I'm being really facetious here. You shouldn't fly like this. And if you fly in the envelope, then uh, you will be prevented from flying like this. Okay, so uh, back to your issue. One thing that I like to do, um, knowing that, you know, again, uh, just to summarize, at the back of the envelope, you fly more efficiently, but less, with less stability. The front of the envelope, you have more stability, but you fly with less efficiency. Okay, so here is my uh, Cessna 152 envelope. One thing I love about this airplane is if you're in the envelope, you're in the acrobatic category. So you should be good for aerobatic maneuvers. Um, so here is my t a typical weight and CG, for instance, if I'm flying with a student, uh, and this is where we are full fuel. And I always like to calculate both full fuel and no fuel, and here is the reason why. The fuel tanks are located back at station 42.2, so it's, it's uh, technically, I think it's off the slide, but you get my point. It's way back here. So what happens to that balancing point as you lose the weight in the back? As you lose the weight in the back, you actually go forward in the envelope. Okay, so that's, that's a good thing, right? Um, so interestingly, a hallmark of good aircraft design is that you tend to locate the fuel uh, about where the loaded airplane is going to be. The reason you do that is, like, I, I suppose Cessna could have put the fuel back in the tail, but what would happen to my CG position, given that weight is so far back, it would go from full fuel to no fuel, 
Okay, so that line would be flatter. So the closer you can put your fuel to where you're actually flying the airplane, that's goodness, that's a good thing. All right, well here's the same um, weight and balance uh, diagram for my Bonanza. And let me just say, I bought my Bonanza in the dumbest way you can buy an airplane. So I was talking to my friend one day and I, I said, you know, I need an acrobatic Bonanza. You know, because it's four place, it's a traveling airplane, and it goes upside down. And uh, he said, oh, you know, my, my IA does the annuals on one. And I said, oh, is it for sale? And he said, no. But I said, you need to go talk to the owner and tell him that he needs to sell it to me. Well, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> and I was too busy to get it, uh, to go get it from Michigan. And so the IA who did the annuals on it delivered it uh, to me. So he lands on my ramp in Sewanee. I walk up to the airplane, open the door, and I look in. I'm like, oh, this is what a Bonanza looks like. I had never even sat in a Bonanza before I bought this airplane. So please don't buy an airplane like that. But what I did is I took the um, POH home to study up before I flew it for the first time. And I, one of the things that I did was I ran a weight and balance. And here is Nikki, uh, full fuel. Interestingly, that's where her fuel is located. Her fuel is located slightly in front of the forward part of the envelope. So guess what happens when she burns off fuel and I lose the weight in the front? It goes back. <laughs> And the first time I ran a weight and balance scenario with, say, you know, three people in my airplane and bags, that's exactly what I saw. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So do your homework on your weight and balance before you buy an airplane. Now, I ended up having the panel redone, and I took every opportunity to move weight forward in, in the, uh, uh, the airplane. So I actually brought her uh, empty CG position forward. But there's still, it's still pretty easy to actually load her with an aft CG. So in this airplane, interestingly, fuel is good. As you lose fuel, you can burn out the back of the envelope. And I think that's the one of the points you were making, right? So um, some of the scenarios you can include when you're running these weight and balances with your students vary the people, also vary the fuel. Uh, in fact, as an examiner, more than once, I've actually found when I see a candidate's weight and balance, this just happened about three weeks ago, it was a 172 and I saw full fuel, no fuel, and I thought there is no way there's no way that could be right. And it turns out that there was a problem with the weight and balance documentation in the aircraft that the mechanic did. They've been running erroneous weight and balances for years. So when you play with those scenarios, fuel, passengers, bags, and all that kind of stuff, uh, once you get to see those sorts of things a lot, you can kind of call BS when you see it. Uh, because I know exactly what a 172 should do, for example. Um, did I address all of your... You, okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, sounds good. Um, all right, so for more on that, that article was uh, from a couple years ago. Um, so with this, I will uh, extend my um, great thanks to NAFI for having me. I really appreciate that.